Welcome to Look Ahead Radio with Tom Arms and Lockwood Phillips. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. Well, it's the day before Thanksgiving, and um, normally uh, we are doing this program in the second hour, but tonight we're doing it in the first hour. Here, the day before Thanksgiving, we are norm- normally we talk to our guest and our, if really, our co-host, Tom Arms of Look Ahead Radio. But today we're talking with him in advance. In fact, we're uh, recording this program uh, in anticipation of the upcoming Thanksgiving holidays. So for those who are thinking about calling in, the phone numbers will not be answered. I do appreciate your participation, and I would ask that if you wish, call in, either call in next week or, for that matter, send us an email at viewpointsradio at hotmail.com or via Facebook at Viewpoints on the Talk Station. And, of course, uh, the program ably handled by Ross Behind the Wall, Window, and Board. So as folks prepare for the Thanksgiving weekend, I just want to, or week ahead, pardon me, and weekend, just wish everyone a very special Thanksgiving this year. And with that note, uh, Tom Arms of Look Ahead Radio joins us. Tom, good afternoon, and happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Thank you very much. I, I celebrated Thanksgiving on Saturday. This past Saturday. This past Saturday. Well, you yeah. see, it's not a public holiday on Thursday. Otherwise, we do it on Thursday. Okay. But, so uh, we, we have Thanksgiving every year. We had 24 people to Thanksgiving. Ooh. Wow. And I always give a speech in which I talk about how the pilgrims gave thanks to all the indigenous people of America for helping to save their lives and make their lives more comfortable in the new land. And I stand up and uh, say thank you to all the indigenous British people who have helped to make my life so nice here in the UK. Well, it's also a time when we're supposed to give thanks to the Almighty for all the plenty that we benefit from. So there is, if you will, a strong um, religious component to it. But um, with, with that said, I'm curious, is there is there... A th- Thanksgiving is a, a unique uh, uh, U.S. celebration. I don't. There's nothing significant. It, it, it about is, but it's based on, it's based on a celebration, a religious celebration here in the U.K. called Harvest Festival. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, and every year there's a Harvest Festival where you give, you go to church, uh, and you give thanks to God uh, for the harvest. Right. And for, you know, in the harvest in every sense of the word, you know, the financial harvest, agricultural harvest, it goes right back to, well, before medieval times, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and traditionally, people bring gifts of food to the church, which are then distributed to the poor. Ah, well, um, well that's one of the purposes of the church was that distribution. That's an interesting uh background on that story of course joining us this afternoon tom arms of look ahead radio and also lookaheadnews.com and by the way look ahead radio is heard around the world and it's always a pleasure to have tom with us uh on wednesdays tom looking at the uh experiences of the past couple of weeks we have a lot to talk about so i want to go there uh very quickly uh i've i've got to ask oh well before i even get into that what's the weather like in london right now Stormy, wet and stormy. We're having flooding, not in London, but in other parts of the country. Uh, We're having flooding, uh, winds up to 80, 90 miles an hour. Uh, It's uh, it's not good weather. I'm staying off my bicycle at the moment. I would would imagine you would. Uh, I'm curious, is this pretty normal for this time of year in the UK? Yes. Okay. Yes, it, 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 it gets very wet and windy this time of year as winter sets in. We usually have some flooding around now and Christmas time. So right. Somewhere in the country doesn't have a nice Christmas. Well, um, we can have that same situation here. Uh, invariably, uh, with weather as broad and as expansive as it is, uh, it has d- different effects. As a matter of fact, we're now experiencing very dry weather in the mountains of North Carolina and severe fl- fires as well. All right, that being said, let's talk about the events of the past week and some of the issues going forward. And I think top of the mind, and we're curious about this in the U.K. and in Europe, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about um, uh, the president-elect's uh, Donald Trump's appointments to his cabinets 
uh, cabinet positions, and I'm wondering what are you hearing, and what are the what is the news there in uh, the UK and Europe? Well, generally speaking, they're horrified. Um, that that's the the general reaction. Um, they particularly don't like Steve Bannon. Um, Mike Pompeo, if I pronounce that correctly, um, is considered not too bad. Uh, Jeff Sessions, they don't like. Um, they're not terribly clean on Mike Flynn. Um, I can't quite figure out how to pronounce Reince Priebus. Have I correctly pronounced it's, that one? It's Reince Priebus. And my question... Reince Priebus. Reince Priebus, I think, has gotten a fairly good press. Let me, um, let me let me shift he's gears. He's the only one. All right, let me let me ask you a quick question. Relative to Steve Bannon, of course, in his capacity and as an advisor, I I have uh, questions about why that's important to uh, Europe. But really, from the perspective of just internal activities in politics, as the Attorney General, uh, the concerns related to Jeff Sessions, what does that have to do with, and why would there be any interest in that in Europe? Uh, because America is a world leader. It sets the tone for so many things. You know, people people follow the American lead. If America has racial problems, they spill over into other countries. You know, if, if you start becoming a white nationalist or white supremacist whoa, country, whoa, whoa, people whoa, whoa. will, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me finish. You know, I mean, I'm just saying. But if they start leaning that way, it enables and emboldens other people in other countries who feel the same way. They point to America as the most powerful country in the world and says, if America can do it, we can too. Wait, I'm here's, sorry, that's the way it is. Well, that's fine, but where did that come up from, uh, the issue of Jeff Sessions? What is this white supremacist? Where is, that, where is this topic even coming from? Well, he was denied a, uh, a federal judgeship. I know it was in 1989, but th this is played quite big uh, here. He was denied a fellow judgeship uh, because of his comments about um, black people. No, no, no. Uh, that, I, I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to get into the I, details. I'm just telling you what was reported. That is well. The report. That that, the, that is what was reported. That he, reporting. And, and that, you cannot deny that the judgeship was denied. No, no. There's there's no question about it. And it's purely politics. And they're taking advantage of it. Perfect example of that is his rather uh, snide and and facetious remark related to the KKK, which has been raised on numerous occasions. They found he always thought the KKK might be good people until he discovered they smoke marijuana. In yeah, the process, but, yeah. but, but, but in the yeah. process, wait a second, Tom, in the process of saying that, he was in the process of prosecuting and winning a case against the KKK. He was being facetious. It's, it's fascinating, and I've got to get into this after this break. What's happening to the concept of satire? It's fascinating hearing this from you uh, in well, the UK. I, I, I think, but, but, I, yes, me, well, let, I'm very good at satire. That, well, let's I get, I, let's, my column last week. let's, let's uh, get to I, that. I, I think I, anyway, right, uh, let's, pat myself on the back there. Well, let's get uh, to that. Well, let's, let's ask, let's let, ask Mr. Trump. Let's get to that. Every time, let's get to every that. Every time he's criticized or, or jokes are made about him on television, he takes offense. Well, hey. Let's get, we'll get to that right after this break. You're listening to youth, uh, with okay. pardon me, uh, our regular program. It's being aired uh, in advance today. It's uh, Look Ahead Radio with uh, viewpoints around the world here on the talk station with Tom Arms here on the talk station FM 107 AM 1240. Look Ahead Radio will return in just a moment. This is Tom Arms with LookAheadNews.com's World Report for the week beginning the 28th of November. Look Ahead broadcast tomorrow's news today so that you can plan to participate. It's a big week for European elections. In the early hours of Monday morning, we will know who will represent France's Republican Party in the presidential elections next April. Will it be former Prime Minister Alain Juppé or former Prime Minister François Fillon? Meanwhile, next Sunday, there are two big elections, presidential elections in Austria, and after that, a constitutional referendum in Italy. The presidential elections are a repeat following the discovery of irregularities in elections in May. The constitutional referendum in Italy is being billed as a confidence vote in the government of Matteo Renzi, who has promised to resign if it goes the wrong way. 
Also next week, the far-right UK Independence Party in Britain announces the results of its leadership elections to replace Nigel Farage. And on Thursday, the Conservative government of Theresa May is threatened with a by-election defeat in Richmond Park at the hands of the pro-European Lib Dems. In other election news, next Wednesday, Somalia stages indirect presidential elections. The West African state of Gambia stages presidential elections on Wednesday. Uzbekistan holds its presidential elections next Sunday. And in the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi faces a challenge to her position as minority leader. In non-election news, Russian President Vladimir Putin gives his State of the Nation address to the Russian Parliament. And Canada lifts visa requirements for Mexicans. And finally, next Wednesday, the Bad Sex in Fiction Award is awarded by the British magazine Literary Review to the writer who produces the worst description of a sex scene in a novel. And that was next week's News Today from LookAtNews.com so that you can plan to participate in the world around you. Stay tuned after this message for LookAtNews.com's expanded world analysis. Quick, what do these sounds have in common? <laughs> these are the sounds of geography. Geography helps us understand connections between people and places. But our kids aren't getting enough of it. Half can't locate Japan or India, and 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. So we created MyWonderfulWorld.org to give kids the power of global knowledge. Go to MyWonderfulWorld.org to learn more. It's a wonderful world. This is Tom Arms with LookAtNews.com's expanded world analysis for the week beginning the 28th of November. Look at broadcast tomorrow's news today so that you can plan to participate. This coming week could be another fork in the road for European politics with primary election results in France, a rerun of a presidential vote in Austria, and a constitutional referendum in Italy. Will Europe continue down the far-right anti-Europe route chosen by Britain, or will it veer back towards the pro-Europe centre and centre-right? On Monday morning, we'll have the second round results of the Republican Party primaries in France. At the time of this broadcast, François Fillon was 15 points ahead of Alain Juppé in the opinion poll. The winner is likely to face National Front leader Marie Le Pen in the presidential vote in April. Fillon is seen as a safe pair of hands, centre-right candidate from the Gaullist mode. He is pro-European, anti-immigration, but not outrageously so, and fiscally conservative. In Italy, Matteo Renzi is predicted by the pollsters to lose his referendum to reform the Senate. The vote has morphed into a vote of confidence in the government and the political establishment. Renzi has threatened a general election if he loses, and the alt-right five-star movement is well-placed to make big gains. If they win, they've promised a referendum on membership of the Eurozone and continued use of the Euro. The position of Austrian president is a largely ceremonial one, but imbued with political symbolism. The left of center Green Party candidate Alexander van der Bellen narrowly defeated the far-right Eurosceptic and anti-immigration Freedom Party candidate Norbert Hofer in elections in May. But after irregularities were discovered in several constituencies, the courts voided the result. The current campaign has been marred by the same viciousness that is touring the other elections in Western democracies. Britain may see a step back towards Europe in a by-election in the London constituency of Richmond Park on Thursday. The election was called after the Conservative MP Zach Goldsmith resigned in protest against the government plans to build a third runway at nearby Heathrow Airport. The by-election issue has shifted to a vote of confidence in the government's Brexit plans and pro-Europe Lib Dem candidate Sarah Olney may come from behind to secure a shock upset. One country that is definitely not swinging to the right is Canada. While Trump ponders his wall, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Thursday lifts the visa requirements for Mexican visitors. To enter Canada, they will only need an electronic travel authorization, which they can order online. Cost? Seven Canadian dollars. And that was next week's news today from lookadnews.com so that you can plan to participate in the world around you. Stay tuned for Viewpoints Around the World with myself and Lockwood Phillips. Welcome back to Look Ahead Radio. Here is Lockwood Phillips. Viewpoints Around the World this afternoon with Tom Arms of Look Ahead Radio and also of LookAheadNews.com. And we got into a pretty uh, raucous 
conversation here just a moment ago, Tom, about the oh, issue. Very uh, well, yes, uh, about the issue of the, the, these innuendos that are uh, continuing to percolate, and it's a little disturbing. We're hearing this in the UK and in Europe, where. Quite frankly, the vast majority of the information is at best cursory, at least is my description, but related to the issue of satire, and we're seeing this here in this country as well, uh, the divide in this country. You know, it's fascinating that the divide happened overnight. It happened instantly with a vote. It didn't take place over the past four or eight years. It just happened instantly, magically. Uh, my question then to you is why Europe and the UK particularly, but Europe is continuing to focus on, uh, if you will, innuendo. And you you actually alluded to that with Jeff Sessions. That, it's a little it's a little disturbing, and a, to, I would say, and use the term unfair. And as far as your comment related to Donald Trump is concerned, uh, he also has been the subject of numerous criticisms. Keep in mind, Tom, he was not the one that released emails uh, against. National security and okay, against Michael, the law. I, but go back I to it. it man, to, go. To, to get a word in edgewise, please. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's it's very important. I think it's very important that, that you, you want me to tell you what's happening in Europe. Uh -huh. And I've I've been out reading the newspapers, and I think we we have to get in some of these comments okay. from the newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so just about some of the uh, the ones uh, that are coming out of the newspapers, Develt has described Bannon as a man who wants to destroy the state. Wow. Okay. Mm. Coriella della Serra in Italy. It's a choice that makes a joke. They're talking about Bannon. It's a choice that makes a joke of Trump's post-election uh, uh, speech mm -hmm. about unity. Post-election unity speech. Sorry. I didn't get that quite right. right. The Financial Times, a very respected newspaper, Steve Bannon is a bully backing another bully. Wow. Uh, well, I, I, the Globe and Mail in Toronto, the problem with Bannon is, is that he's just like Trump, an unprincipled bully with an extremely thin skin, who even after this election continues to tweet in the voice of a petulant know-it-all wow. who doesn't think his brilliant ideas are taken seriously by the rest of the world. The Daily Gleaner in Jamaica, rather than great, Trump has made America hate again. Wow. All right, that, okay. that, that's, now, those, those are the headlines. Now, those, are what, those are what people are saying. You, and, and just focusing on whether they're right or wrong or whether they're basic just on innuendo and, and a few sound bites. A lot of the sound bites are coming from Trump's tweets, mind right, you. Right. That is what people are thinking. Okay, yeah, let, let me, quick question for you, Tom. And by the way, let me just say, folks, that uh, Tom is pointing out the stories that he's reading in the papers. This is not, uh, we're not getting into opinion. What we're hearing is, uh, in this case, the facts as he's read them in the papers. Now, the source of those facts will, will are worthy of dispute, but that's fine. We're not going to get into that conversation. A quick question for you, Tom, in light of these rather critical remarks of this current and the new administration. My question is, is this a sense of um, a, a fait accompli, or is there a possibility that, quite frankly, uh, the, this new administration will give, be given a chance, or are we seeing the door being closed uh, early on in this administration to the world uh, politique? Okay, well, last night my wife went to a, a, a meeting, which I would have liked to have gone to, but I had to work hard for you. Good. Which is fine. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um uh, and it was addressed by Nick Clegg, who was the deputy prime minister. And he basically said, we have to sit back and let them, meaning both the conservative government and the Trump administration and all the other alt-right groups, hmm. let them hang themselves. But we have to be prepared to pick up the pieces when things go wrong. I find it fascinating that you're including in this the conversation of the alt Right, uh, and which I would argue... I, I think I, Trump has been considered alt-right. That's interesting. Well, I, that's an important observation to be made uh, from our, our host, co-host, and, and guest here this afternoon, Tom Arms of Look Ahead Radio. And, of course, we're talking with him about viewpoints around the world and what we're hearing in the viewpoints around the world. All right, let's talk here for a moment. Uh, look, look, wait, just one last thing. Uh -huh. a, a video which is playing very big uh, on uh, websites here in the U.K., 
is one of a far right group having a meeting in New York. Uh, I think something new, the Atlantic group or something like that. And they managed to get videos inside of people standing up, giving a Nazi salute and shouting, mm -hmm. Heil Trump. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and of course, that's no effort on the part of either this administration, the Trump administration, or any of his participants to take advantage of that, nor were they even perpetrating that, and have called it out as bad and, and unacceptable. But, uh, but the point, that, the but point, point is, matters. They're not telling. It, it, this is the frustration that this administration has faced all time in the campaign and it's interesting that uh the media has ignored all the other candidates that were running for republican uh the, the republican nomination they basically ignored uh, all the candidates in the democrat nomination seeking the democrat nomination save hillary clinton and donald trump and bernie sanders only because he had such strong grassroots support it is unfortunate that this is how it's being detailed in uh, the European press. I, I do find it interesting, though. You're you're telling me that in essence, it, the die is cast, and there's it, you don't believe that this administration is going to be given much of a, uh, shall we say, a honeymoon or a time to prove itself. Well, there, there's no honeymoon. Okay. They they're going to have an uphill struggle proving themselves. Wow. I and mean, of course, this is what you're reading and seeing there in the media in Europe. All right, um, we've got to get to other events in the Trump administration. I want to get to the trade issues here in a few moments. But sticking with the cabinet selections um, related to, and uh, by the way, I saw an interesting story, uh, the fact that uh, the EU is thinking about attempting to develop its own army. In fact, um, there is some concern, of course, now with actions on the part of uh, uh, Mr. Putin and Russia. Uh, What's happening there in the military environment in Europe at this time? Well, they're very worried. And on Thanksgiving Day, I'm going to a reception Lithuanian embassy for Armed Forces Day, uh, where I shall hear in great detail from the Lithuanians just how worried they are, because they think that they're really in danger of being <clears throat> annexed by Russia. Um, uh, that is the Lithuanians, Estonians and the Latvians. OK, you know, this is well, interesting. The but European army, basically, the Europeans, uh, it's a reaction to what Trump has been saying. Uh, the Europeans now do not trust the Trump administration to protect them should they be attacked or bullied or threatened by Russia. They just they are getting very skeptical. And so they feel they have to do more. Now, I know Trump wants them to do more. But there's a difference between doing more because they want to do more and being forced into it and forced into a situation where their policies will diverge from those of the United States. They point to people like Mike Flynn, who has said that he thinks that NATO is obsolete and that U.S. should develop a different set of alliances for the 21st century. Uh, all these things are sort of piling up and making the NATO members very, very nervous, and they're being pushed into areas where they're not familiar, they're not comfortable, they're out of their comfort zone, and they're very worried. In some regards, I, one would argue that's a good thing. Change is important. And by the way, related to General Flynn's remarks, he was talking specifically about the asymmetric wars that we are fighting at this time. We're going to get back to this in just a moment with uh, Tom Arms of Look Ahead Radio and, of course, also, lookaheadnews.com. You're listening to Viewpoints Around the World here on the talk station. Look Ahead Radio will return in just a moment. They say the best things in life are free. So, hey, why are we paying so much for our basic information and entertainment needs? The average cable TV bill has more than doubled in the last 10 years. The price of movie tickets keeps going up. So, exactly what is free today anyway? Well, you're listening to it. Local radio. Support the advertisers that support this radio station. And keep listening. We won't send you a bill. There are still some things you just shouldn't have to pay for. We now return to Look Ahead Radio. Here is Lockwood Phillips. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. 
We have with us this afternoon, and and it's earlier than normal, we have Tom Arms. This portion of the program has been pre-recorded so that the staff here at the talk station can prepare for Thanksgiving and uh, in the process recognizing that so many others have uh, activities to uh, engage in with their families as as we give thanks for a great year and uh, great opportunities in front of us. Tom Arms, of of course, of Look Ahead Radio. Uh, heard every Friday evening here on the talk station, as well as Look Ahead Radio, heard around the world, and lookaheadnews.com. Tom, we were talking a few moments ago about the uh, the, the operations and the and pardon me the uh, structure for the new administration, the Trump administration. It is striking that um, based on just comments, political comments, which is, have historically been. Uh, if you will, mitigated once an oath of office is taken. Uh, I'm hearing from you that uh, many in Europe and the U.K. and around the world are taking these uh, comments from uh, Mr. Trump as being absolute. I I find that fascinating, which goes back to the question earlier, would there be any kind of a honeymoon stage for the uh, new administration? And obviously uh, this uh, these facts, as well as the comments you made earlier, indicate there will not be. But let's move on to other issues, and one that really kind of relates to a broader topic, and that of trade, both with the European Union and Brexit, and also now with uh, trade around the world. And, of course, uh, as as recently as today, uh, Mr. Trump has announced that uh, he is definitely going to pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership What does that say to uh, the folks, particularly there in the United Kingdom, also in Europe, Western Europe primarily? Uh, What's the feeling? Uh, He's also said that he is uh, looking at uh, renegotiating uh, NAFTA. But what is this? uh, Could this be seen as a positive for Europe or a negative? And what, again, is the reaction? A negative. Definite negative. Uh, they see it as another sign of American isolationism, or should we say Trump isolationism. Now, they're very worried. Everyone, you know, is is worried about the rise of China as a political power. Mm -hmm. They're not so worried about the rise of it as an economic power. And they see America's pulling out of the TPP as providing China with a huge political vacuum Mm. into which it can move almost overnight. Uh, The TPP was not only an economic agreement, it had vast political and military uh, connections as well. And America pulling out of that is a wonderful opportunity for China. The China, there's a, dele, uh, there's a, uh, a meeting taking place at the moment of Asia Pacific Rim countries, APEC. Uh, it's been it's taking place in Peru. The Chinese delegation is jumping for joy and they're going around and telling all the other countries there. You can count on us because unlike America, we will always be in Asia. We are an Asian country so we can protect you. Come jump into bed with us. Forget about America. And they're listening. All right, we, but another side to this, and we talked about this several months back, uh, the U.K. was working diligently to strengthen its trade association with China. Is that not seen as a positive for, for, the, Euro, for, for the U.K.? No. If not, why not? No, no, no. It, it, I, I mean, it, it, just because America has TPP or would have had TPP, does not mean Europeans can't have their own trade agreements with Asian countries. Uh, Not not at all. Or they can have separate agreements with China. Mm -hmm. No, we're talking about the political and military vacuum that's going to be left. I mean, the United States is, at this moment, a political and military power in Asia. 75,000 American troops in Asia. Uh, and it is a political power there. And because of TPP, uh, it was it was going to become bigger um, and it was going to hold back the expansion of China politically and militarily. TPP. All right. Well, what, what, uh, does, what does... Ash, Ash Carter said that TPP was worth several aircraft carriers. All right. Let, let's go with. Uh, and of course, Ash Carter, Secretary of Defense. But let's let's talk here for a moment about the issue of Brexit now. 
Look at the U.S. They're uh, looking to alter their trading uh, trade agreements. You've got the United Kingdom engaged in altering its trade agreements with the European Union, and you have members within the European Union, France, one of them, uh, I think Denmark uh, and Italy, all looking at and are looking at altering their trade agreements. Is, is this a matter of um, just an economy that really has not been all that expansive and beneficial to all parties, or is this a matter of uh, politics? The world economy is definitely slowing down. Mm -hmm. It started to slow down in 2008 in a big way with the banking crisis, and it has not picked up. And yes, people are becoming disillusioned with the political establishment. Uh, Next week, we have a series of elections happening. Uh, on Sunday, we have the, the French uh, Republican presidential primary runoff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the, at the end of next week, we have a constitutional referendum uh, in Italy. And if the prime minister loses that, he says he will resign. And if he does, he's going to call a general election and he might well lose that to an alt-right group. Uh, there's an alt-right or far-right group running for president uh, in Austria. Uh, they might well win that. Um, and all these are seen as anti-establishment votes. Um, France, I don't think, is going to go that route. You say but, you, you, don't th- you don't think um, we're talking about... But uh, I think there's dangers. There are dangers elsewhere. I think Italy might. Italy's economy is really suffering badly. To give you an example, you know, 25% unemployment in the south uh, of the country. Whew. Their GDP... The borrowing against GDP is, I think, 135% of GDP. The wow. United States is something like 75, 80%. The, the, Italy is technically insolvent. Okay, let, let's talk about that for a real quick second uh, related to uh, the economy, particularly in uh, Southern Europe, Italy, and then I'm going to throw go across uh, to Greece. Um, Greece, uh, they were in economic uh, shambles as well. Is there any improvement happening? And, and again, we know none of this has benefited the uh, European Union, it strikes me. So it strikes me that the establishment has failed miserably, and what we're seeing is a political, uh, pardon me, a populist uprising. Yes, that, no, that's exactly what you're seeing. Okay. Exactly. On Greece, they're stuck in Groundhog Day. Uh-huh. Uh, it's very important to them that uh, that mm-hmm. they stay in the euro, and as long as they are in the euro, they can't devalue their currency, uh, and which is a standard way of trying to to pull themselves out of recession. Uh, so they're just gradually sticking where they are, which is very poor. All right, I, I, I think one big piece of news which has come out this week is that Angela Merkel has said she is going to run for a fourth term. Right. Uh, now, this this I think is very important because Angela Merkel is emerging as the last international center left or centrist politician or statesperson in the world. Hmm. Everyone else is either. Well, they're all growing to the alt right, to be honest. And she's well, the last one. But I, I think she I didn't think that's, want to. That is unfair. She did not want to run. Wait, 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 wait. I, I've, got to, I've got to challenge you on this one, Tom. I don't know that that is necessarily alt-right, the extreme right, just as I would not well, argue. Well, shall we extreme, say right wing? That move, yes, let's, let's say right of center, a populist movement. I, I, think I would it's, say I, Trump was right of center. All right, I would uh, definitely. I just think it's an error to say that this is, uh, and by the way, the, the normal... Um, connotation of uh, alt-right is your extremist groups, uh, uh, neo-Nazi, white supremacist, just as your okay, alt-left. I'm not just, saying that just, Trump is a right, okay. I, 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 is, okay. a, is a okay. white supremacist. Right, but, but I'm I just saying, I'm just, however, that he has emboldened well, uh, but, but, and enabled those people no. who look upon him as their leader. Well, the other aspect of this is I'm talking about this in Europe as well, with uh, the fact that you've got uh, very conservative leaders, and by the way, speaking of conservative leaders, you you may have some changes there in Europe as well. I, I've got to, as we get into this, and I, I've, I've since we're talking about trade, and we've got about two minutes before we go to the next break, Tom. 
Let's talk very quickly about the efforts on the part of uh, Donald Trump to and uh, to sort of uh, lean towards uh, Nigel Farage. Am I pronouncing his last name correct? Nigel Farage. Farage yeah. um, to be ambassador. Uh, I thought it was. I thought it was a bit presumptive on his part to be blunt but uh it was a major diplomatic faux pas well you do not and i'll be writing about this in my column and observations expert you you hear me more on this you know anyone who knows anything about diplomacy knows you do not publicly say who you want to be the ambassador the ambassador is meant to represent the country they come from not the country they're going Not to. Not the country they're going, going to. to. I know, I know, I know. Uh, but it is interesting. I mentioned this in light and live the fact we're talking about Brexit because Nigel Farage was uh, the leader, uh, one of the leaders in the uh, elimination of uh, the UK. Nigel Farage has never even been elected to Parliament. But but he's he, still. No, wait a minute. Let me finish, Lockwood. Okay. He, in the Leave campaign, he was sidelined by the official Leave campaign. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. Ah. He was far, too far to the right for them. Oh, well, all right. Okay, he ran his own separate campaign. Well, it, that's it's... that's the sort of person that that's that's what makes people think that when Trump wants him to be and publicly announces that he wants him to be the ambassador, it makes people here in Europe very nervous. Interesting. All right. We're going to get back to this in just a moment with uh, viewpoints around the world with Tom Arms of Look Ahead Radio and, of course, also LookAheadNews.com. You're listening to Viewpoints on the talk station, Viewpoints Around the World. Look Ahead Radio will return in just a moment. Observations of an expat by Tom Arms from LookAheadNews.com. It didn't take long. Fortunately, Donald Trump's first diplomatic faux pas involved America's closest and most forgiving ally. But Trump's tweet that Britain appoint UKIP leader Nigel Farage as British ambassador to Washington won't be forgotten. An ambassador is sent from one country to another to represent their country's interests, not the interests of the country to which they are sent. The last person you want to send to your closest ally is a person who is your political opponent. They are unlikely to fairly represent the view of a government with which they disagree. Next, there are diplomatic conventions, and there are reasons for those conventions. One of the conventions is that a foreign leader does not publicly request that a citizen of another country be appointed ambassador to their country. And you really can't get more public than Twitter. You can privately, discreetly ask, but not publicly. Why? because it then puts the government of the other country in a very difficult position. If they don't approve of the person, then they either offend you by not making the appointment, or they weaken their domestic position by being seen as an American puppet. There have been historic exceptions to this rule. Hitler insisted that certain named individuals be appointed ambassadors to Berlin from the countries he conquered. Stalin did the same. Trump and Steve Bannon may be enjoying a major bromance with Nigel Farage, but rest assured that the man is very much unappreciated by the vast majority in his own country. His every attempt to be elected to the British Parliament has failed. During the referendum campaign, he had to run a parallel leave campaign because the official leave campaign refused to be associated with him. His party, the UK Independence Party, or UKIP as it is commonly known, is embroiled in a major internal battle. So much so that one of the leading figures ended up in a hospital after a fight in a parking lot with another UKIPper. They did elect a replacement for Farage, but she resigned the leadership after only 12 days. And this week, she quit the party altogether. Nigel Farage has stepped back into the role as interim leader while they argue amongst themselves. Despite the internecine war, UKIP did garner 12.5% of the popular vote in the 2015 election. To obtain that vote, they undermined the power base of the two main political parties, Labour and Conservative. So both of those parties oppose Farage, not just on policy issues, but on political grounds as well. They don't want to be seen as being viewed as an American puppet, 
and they don't want to provide Nigel Farage with a platform for attacking UK policies in the middle of difficult Brexit negotiations. There are very good reasons for diplomatic conventions which extend back thousands of years. Just imagine how difficult it is to coexist with your neighbors, especially those who give loud parties or have children who regularly crash balls through your windows. Imagine trying very hard not to lose your temper and searching for the words that prevent a local difficulty from spiraling out of control. Now, imagine that the neighbors don't speak your language. They wear strange clothes, their religion is different, and their native culture alters their methods of problem solving. On top of that, they have a large family which seems incapable of agreeing on anything. Even if you speak the same language, as is the case with intertwined Britain and America, you are faced with what the Irish writer George Bernard Shaw called two nations divided by a common language. Finally, imagine that this neighbor with a large argumentative family, different language, culture, religion, and perspective on the world has a massive army camped in their garden. Perhaps now you're getting an idea of why it is so important that diplomatic business is conducted according to agreed rules, quietly, and not on public platforms. So, will someone, please, for the sake of world peace, close Donald Trump's Twitter account? Welcome back to Look Ahead Radio. Here is Lockwood Phillips. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. Uh, we have joining us this afternoon, again, a little earlier than normal, uh, Tom Arms of LookAheadNews.com and, of course, Look Ahead Radio around Look Ahead Radio and heard around the world on radio stations, including the, uh, this one here at the talk station. Uh, and Tom's joining us from London. Tom, we were talking a few moments ago about... Uh, basically leadership roles and uh, you were mentioning that Angela Merkel much to her chagrin is being enticed to run for a fourth term and we'll move on to other countries here in just a moment if she in fact is elected uh, how long would she run as uh, the uh, as she would be the, as the prime minister Chan prime minister of chancellor uh, chancellor called, which chancellor, is the same thing as prime minister right how long would she be serving uh, well, it's it's a Westminster model, so as long as she has a majority okay. in the Bundestag, uh, but it's probably four to five years. Okay, and then um, the next So question. she she would have been in office for a total of 15 years, I think. All right, um, and then with that, we're looking at other impacts around the world. Uh, France, of course, we were chatting earlier about uh, Marie Le Pen and uh, 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 Mr. Filon. Uh, th they're they're of course running for the conservative um, seat or actually uh, a primary Republican party. Yeah, they're they're conservative uh, party there. Tony Blair apparently is interested in re-entering politics there in the UK. What impact might Not this have? As an elected person, though. Oh, okay. No, he uh, well at least it, it it not at the moment. He wants to set up an anti-Brexit campaign. And he's been busy putting together money uh, and people to support it. Richard Branson is said to be funding it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, that's a virgin, he, that's a virgin he airline. He's got the former deputy prime minister on board. Right. Uh, and also a man, a prominent politician uh, from, the, uh, from the Labour Party called Chuka Umuna. Uh, and, and they basically are going to campaign to have a second referendum mm -hmm. once the terms of the departure from the EU are known. Well, now, uh, with that said, uh, how well received is his interest in uh, participating in this? And what is the, what's the future of uh, the British exit from the EU or Brexit as it's known? Uh, is there a chance that it could be revisited? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, I, I, I think there is. I, I think there's a definite chance. There's a big court case uh, in just about two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's going before the U.K. Supreme Court, uh, and the U.K. Supreme Court, High Court has already said, that is the, the lower court, which is roughly equivalent to a federal court, mm -hmm. uh, has said that 
uh, Theresa May cannot on her own invoke Article 50. She needs the approval of Parliament. Okay. Now, if the Supreme Court upholds that decision, which it's likely to, that will delay the passing of the bill required to invoke Article 50. And if it's delayed enough, then the, the negotiations for departure are unlikely to be repeated before this time for the next election, okay. in which case the next election will effectively become a second referendum. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that much of the world's politic is now uh, surrounded or, or, or involving trade and economy? I want to move to two other items before we wrap it up. We've got about two minutes with you, Tom. Tom Arms, of course, of Look Ahead Radio. Problems in Hong Kong. What's going on there? Well, basically, the, the, uh, there's a young, a young group called the Umbrella Group, and they are fighting for greater autonomy, almost independence from China. Mm. Uh, and uh, two, of the, uh, two of the members were recently elected, well, several members were recently elected to the local legislative council. Two of them you know, said some rather nasty things while giving their oath of office when they would be sworn in. Now, this has been done before in Hong Kong, and usually what happens is they're given a second chance to do it. Mm -hmm. But this time, they weren't. They were barred. Mm. They were said they cannot be members of the executive legislature. Wow. And, right. and, so, and so this is sparking off more protests. You, and, of uh, course, and, of course, the um, <clears throat> relations between Hong Kong and mainland China are very, very sketchy at best. I, I've got to move on to one other quick one because I find this interesting. The Great Firewall of China blocks searches of North Korean leader Fatty Kim the <clears> Third. <throat> yes, well, that's the nickname a lot of Chinese have for the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. Hmm. They call him Fatty Kim the Third. But the Great Firewall, the Chinese authorities decided that... Uh, you shouldn't be ridiculing foreign leaders. And so they blocked all searches using the term Fatty Kim the Third. Wow. And so the, the Chinese uh, the Chinese internet searchers are changing it uh, and getting around that little problem by uh, searching for Fatty Kim or the third Fatty Kim, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, well, of course, we can always uh, rely on the um, Russians to help hack into this Chinese system. All right. I want to thank you for your time this afternoon, Tom. Tom Arms, of course, of Look Ahead Radio and LookAheadNews.com. Ta Tom, as we wrap it up, wishing you a very best of uh, Thanksgivings, that you, one that you've already celebrated, and, of course, we to celebrate ours uh, tomorrow. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Lockwood. Viewpoints around the world with Tom Arms here on the talk station. And as I mentioned a moment ago, a very happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners and to all of, uh, well, to the world. Again, you're listening to Viewpoints. Look Ahead Radio is a production of the talk station.